Well, today we are in week three of our series, For the Love of God. Look at your neighbor and say, for the love of God. Right, we're, we're saying, hey, can we in any way redeem this statement that most people make out of frustration? Can we redeem it to make it a statement out of fascination? Like, oh my goodness, for the love of God, he's, he's so good, he's so merciful, he's so loving, his grace is sufficient, and he is for us. He'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a good God for the love of God. I wanna give my life over to him. And I do have to say, I, I thought last week, uh, Daryl Strawberry just did a fantastic job. I just thought the blessing that he was to our church. And, you know, we're so spoiled as a church to have uh, individuals from around the country and around the world come and uh, share uh, from this platform and teach to our church. And every single one of them is remarkable. But uh, I did find with Daryl uh, how impressive he was in terms of his just approachability and humility and his willingness to stay after services and pray with people and talk scripture and get to know them, take photos with them. And uh, his humility was great. And I, I started calling him Uncle Daryl. And I think at some point we might have to have Uncle Daryl back. And I just thought he was fantastic. Can we show him some love? But if you missed last week, you can check that out online. And if you missed week one, you're, you're gonna wanna go back and listen to that as well because it kind of laid the foundation uh, for where we're going today. In this series, we are talking about this idea of love. I get the feeling that 2024 uh, is gonna need some love in our world. And maybe as a body of believer and as a community of faith, you and I can lead the charge and be an example and we can have an impact and a positive influence in a world that desperately needs the love of Jesus Christ, amen? And we live in a world where love, the concept of love, this understanding or idea of love is distorted, diluted, and in many ways, uh, misleading. And so we have said, hey, in this series, uh, let's open up the pages of scripture and what does God have to say about love? Because as believers, we believe God is love. He is the source, the embodiment, the fulfillment of perfect love. And so what does he have to say on the topic and what does scripture say and how does individuals throughout God's word articulate and explain and apply love uh, to our lives. And in week one, we looked at something John had wrote in which John established this idea of agape. Someone say agape. And at the time, most of these individuals who were writing, they were writing in the Greek. And the Greeks had four words for love. One meant a love that pertained to desire and need and longing. Another was a love that was based in affection. And the third was a love that was based in friendship. These are all responses to something. They are what would be known as secondary loves. And then there was a fourth and that was agape. And what they established in scripture is agape is a primary love. It's not a response, it's a reality that love existed before you and I came to be. In fact, you and I uh, have our being as a result of perfect, infinite love that God in his love set into motion humanity. It's amazing and what that says is, it is God's love for us that instills our value, our worth, and our identity before we ever had to do anything. That you don't have to perform to earn God's love. God loves you not because of who you are, but because of who he is. And so that's kind of the cliff notes of what uh, week one was about. And it's just really important for you to understand that uh, there's nothing you can do that could earn more of God's love. And there's nothing you could do that could ever lose any of God's love, that God loves you perfectly and fully at all times forever. That is outstanding. And so it is learning to live from the love of God, from this posture of strength and confidence, knowing that we are loved unconditionally and for the love of God is where we're going now in this conversation. And when I say for the love of God, please know this, I'm not saying you and I should wake up every single day and live in a way that earns God's love. It's not saying, hey, I'm doing this for God's love in return. No, it's saying, because I've been marked by this grace, because I have had this experience with Christ, I now live on mission to accomplish love's purpose in the world. I am now a part of God's you know, redemptive plan and I wake up every single day with the mindset and the posture of I am accomplishing and participating in love's mission in the world for the love of God essentially. And 
Today, we're going to look at something the Apostle Paul said. In fact, many scholars and commentators would say that what Paul writes in the book of Corinthians is the greatest essay on the concept of love. So this is a big one, and we're gonna do some heavy lifting, and chances are, like most cases, I'm gonna overdo it and probably share too much information, uh, but we're gonna get through it together. And this comes to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which a lot of people are familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In fact, maybe if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13 because you've been to a wedding. And most weddings quote this verse, which says, love is patient and love is kind, right? It, it keeps no record of wrongs and it doesn't rejoice in evil, but it always trusts, it always perseveres. Love never fails. It's this beautiful crescendo of the idea. And though it is appropriate uh, to read a passage like that at a wedding, and I've done so many times myself, it is important to know that when Paul first sits down to write this letter and this essay on love, he's not writing it to a couple getting married. He's writing it to a church. And so this idea of love is aimed directly at a community of believers. And it's when we understand that this message is also aimed at a community of believers such as ourselves, we can gain tremendous value and insight as to what does God seek to do in and through our lives. But before we read the passage in its entirety, uh, I, I do wanna give you some context. I do think if you, you don't take scripture in its context, you could really miss the point. And Corinth in ancient times was a very influential city. In fact, in terms of real estate, it was only four miles wide. So it wasn't a big piece of land, but it was strategic and critical in the sense that it was the piece of land that connected the North and the South region. Uh, Timothy Keller, who is uh, one of the greatest influences on my personal theology and just philosophy of ministry, who recently passed away, is a tremendous thinker, pastor, teacher, leader. Uh, he once said that Corinth was the ancient equivalent of the Panama Canal that so much of commerce and trade and progress within the day had to run through Corinth. And what you find in the history books, and again, never take my word for it, you ought to be a student and go do your own research. What you find is there came a point where the Romans conquered Corinth. And for a season, uh, for a few years actually, uh, Corinth laid dormant, nothing was happening there. And then the Romans realized, wait a second, this is a strategic piece of real estate. We need to uh, invest into it. We need to put infrastructure into it. We need to maximize on this land because there's a lot of opportunity there. And as the Romans did so, people began to gravitate to Corinth. And it was a place of opportunity. It was a place of affluence and influence. And it was a place where people with ambition and dreams uh, would come together. And so it was widely diverse, it was highly influential, and it was very affluent. It would be many ways the equivalent of our modern day New York City. And what I love about Paul is Paul was just so bold in his faith that he would just go on mission. And he's like, listen, I believe that the gospel applies to every context. And I believe the gospel applies to all people. And Paul was a leader of leaders. And so he would say, I am going to go and engage the influencers in our culture. And I'm gonna go engage the influencers in our society because if I can have an impact on them, well, if I lead the leaders, the leaders will lead everybody else. And so he would go to these cities and he shows up in Corinth, and again, if you want some extra homework, I can't go there today, but Acts chapter 18 would be a great chapter uh, for you to read this week because it tells us about Paul's arrival in Corinth. And what I love about Paul is he just shows up on the scene and he just begins reasoning with people. In fact, that's the statement you'll read. Paul would reason with those living in Corinth. And at times he would get in debates and he would persuasively defend the gospel and the cause of Christ. And eventually people started coming to know Christ. He would raise up leaders. He would develop disciples and they would launch a church in Corinth, in fact, Paul had such influence and was such a threat to the secular culture of the day that what you find is they actually start to abuse and attack you know, Paul, which just know as a follower of Christ, if you're gonna do anything great for, for God, and you see this all throughout scripture, all the heroes, uh, they, they faced 
uh, persecution and resistance and adversity, that just comes with it. Uh, the birthmark of a follower of Christ is a target and it seems to enlarge the closer and closer you and I get to our purpose in life. And Paul is in Corinth, he, he develops this church and what Paul would do is he would then establish leaders and then he would move on to the next city and he would stay on mission. And while he was making his way throughout the region, he would stay in contact with the churches and the leaders that he developed and planted and he would write them letters and they would write him letters. And so what we're gonna read today is some of the correspondence between Paul and the church in Corinth. And what we're gonna find today is what Paul said to this church that was living in a culture that was obsessed with success and sex, uh, well, it is highly uh, practical and relevant to our current culture. You can find that, man, it seems as if he's writing this to the church of America as we sit. And it's important to see how he starts out. Watch how Paul begins this letter. In chapter one, he says, hey, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, which is the same language that John used in chapter one, that so much of this conversation gets placed in the family. And if you don't start looking at other believers as brothers and sisters in Christ, you're gonna miss the mark. And chances are you're gonna mistreat or overlook the importance of the relationships with those around you in the faith. He says, this is a family dynamic and I appeal to you, Brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. He says that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you. And so we're like, oh my goodness, this is so hard to think about because we live in times where nobody can agree on anything. And we're very familiar with division and things that are divisive. And Paul is writing to a church that is experiencing division. And he's saying, no, 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 no. Don't take your cues from culture. Those type of tendencies within the body of believers, those type of tendencies within the family of God, they're misplaced, they're dysfunctional. In fact, they're gross. They don't honor God. And as believers, we should pay attention to those things. Hey, don't let there be any divisions. Now watch what he says, that you will be perfectly united in mind and thought, he's saying, guys, we've gotta get on the same page in our thinking. Because if we don't start thinking productively, we're not going to act productively. Because what comes into your mind will come out through your life. Can I get an amen? All right, this is stuff we should teach our kids. He says, brothers and sisters, some, I love this statement, from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Which I love that God chose to use other people's story in the Bible and not ours. Like I, anytime I go to the page, like say the book of Psalms and David is writing in his journal and his journal makes its way into God's word. I'm like, oh my goodness, thank you for using David's journal and not my journal. When you read this, Paul receives a letter from Chloe's family and he just publicizes it to the entire church. And then God's like, yeah, we're gonna put that in the Bible. Can you imagine like, say like your email or your letter that you sent got read publicly to the entire church, right? Like the one that you wrote that was like, hey, you know, I was at a small group and homegirl was talking crazy and she was slandering some folks. You should know this. Can you imagine if I got up here and was like, hey, to the homegirl who's talking trash about everybody, that's causing problems in our church. And so he lays it out there and this is what the tension was. He says, what I mean is this, one of you says, well, I follow Paul. And another says, I follow Apollos. And another says, well, I follow Cephas. Still, another says, I follow Christ. And I'm like, oh my goodness, God help us sidestep this air. Let this never be true of our church. You're saying there are four camps and three out of the four get it wrong? That one's like, well, I follow Paul and I follow Cephas and I follow Apollos and only one out of the four, 25% actually get it right. And they're like, uh, I follow Jesus, right? And so this is a huge miss. And what I love about Paul is he just doesn't leave it. He, he presses on it. And he says, hey folks, is Christ divided, which here's something you should know. There are no churches in heaven. No churches, just a church. And what's gonna be so comical, I can't wait for heaven. I hope there's popcorn. I just wanna find a bench and I just wanna watch the whole thing because you're gonna have all these Christians who spent their whole life arguing with each other over nonsense and they're gonna show up and they're gonna be like, crap, we're all on the same team. 
Like who thought we were all gonna be a part of the same church because we, we at times just fight over nonsense. And Paul's like, yeah, be careful about this stuff because this will hinder a church's productivity and you will forfeit your potential and all that God could do in and through this body of believers. And what I love about Paul is he's a good leader. He doesn't go on to talk about Apollos. He doesn't go on to talk about Cephas. No, he just, he focuses and takes ownership on his own end. And he says this, he says, hey, was Paul crucified for you? He goes on to say, were you baptized in the name of Paul? He takes it further and he says, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Christus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. He's like, I didn't do this for this purpose, but I'm so thankful that I didn't run around baptizing a bunch of you because you would be missing the point. And what Paul is saying to the Corinth church, and the reason why God put this in his word is because he knew, hey, this isn't the first time God's people will struggle with this, and this isn't the last time God's people will struggle with this. We have a propensity and a tendency to miss the point. And Paul's just saying, hey, as believers, you ought to be sharp in your thinking. Hey, let's not miss the point uh, because God seeks to do something amazing in and through our lives. And what Paul is pressing on here and something that you and I need to always pay attention is the difference between preferences and convictions. A lot of times you, you, people get confused by this. In fact, you could uh, say that this is a mark in spiritual maturity where individuals uh, think their preferences are convictions. And what happens is we get really passionate about our preferences and we start attributing to those preferences the weight of a conviction. And no, convictions are rooted in scripture. They're rooted in God's word. They're rooted in his command, his principles and his truth. And they are anchored in the way, the truth, the life and his name is Jesus Christ. Those are convictions. And then there are preferences. And look, everybody has preferences. I have preferences, you have preferences. And what Paul is saying is when churches get focused on preferences and they start to assume their preferences are convictions, they start to miss the point. And how does it play out in the story of Corinth? They started preferring different leaders. Well, I prefer Apollos and I prefer Cephas and I prefer Paul. And those are all preferences. What's the conviction? I follow Jesus, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's the conviction. And as believers, We need to be mindful and be able to delineate, hey, this is a preference, but this is a conviction. And in addition to that, I think it is really critical for us to always remember there is an ocean of a gap, a chasm between leadership and lordship. And this is the thing that you're gonna be like, man, he makes this point often. He says this a lot. And some things need to be repeated because we often need to be reminded Folks, there is a big difference between leadership and lordship. And what happens in churches, especially churches that grow in size, and this could definitely happen in a church like ours, and I'm telling you, if we develop these tendencies, we start to develop gross habits and a ton of dysfunction within our church. And that is when we start to obsess over man's leadership rather than God's lordship. It's a huge miss. And here's what happens in the church world. We build platforms that are 40 inches tall and give an individual microphone and suddenly it gives an unnecessary and unwarranted varnish to an individual that makes them look more impressive than they are. And if you and I were to have coffee, you'd walk away thinking, well, that was pretty underwhelming. The only difference between you and I when we show up is they give me a microphone, but it is level ground at the foot of the cross. Don't ever get obsessed with man's leadership and overlook the lordship of Jesus Christ. He is the head of this church. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He's not retiring. He's not resigning. He's immovable and he is faithfully leading the charge. And he made a promise upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And anyone who wants to join me for the ride will have the thrill of a lifetime and you'll get to experience a fulfillment and a joy and a purpose that surpasses anything else this world can offer. I mean, Paul's going in and I'm just telling you, guys, Jesus is a big deal. Like when we substitute man for God, 
And please don't ever do it to me because I'm, I'm telling you, uh, you're gonna put a lot of pressure on me that's gonna stress me out and I'm going to disappoint you. I'm gonna let you down. Uh, it's about his lordship. And it's in this context that Paul then just starts to run the gauntlet of topics. And he's addressing everything like, hey, Chloe told me a lot of things and we're just gonna, we're gonna address them all. And so he's going down the list one after another. Well, then he comes to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, he starts talking about the body, that we are one body with many parts. You ever read this? Wave at me if you've ever heard this passage. Because what happens is, is they're in Corinth and they have all these people who are really ambitious and really obsessed with success and they're really excited about their gifting and they're really excited about what sets them apart. And so there's all this competition within the body of Christ. So I'm an ear, you're an eye, you're a tongue, you're a toe, whatever it was, it's weird. But they're competing with each other. And it's in this idea of the body of Christ that Paul then takes it further and he starts to address spiritual giftings, which I know some people, when it comes to the spiritual gifts, the things that you see in the book of Acts, especially Acts 2 and so forth, uh, people get uncomfortable. And I would say that I fully believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 100%. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now know this, um, there is a spectrum to that statement. And there are a lot of individuals who would make that same statement who I would say, but how you and I apply and approach and think about that is not always the same. And I think to have some balance there, I don't think the church should be a circus. And I think a lot of times the way in which Paul is talking about the order of the gifts of the spirit uh, is more of a context like a small group, not a church meeting across 15 locations. So you have to understand some of this stuff. And here's the thing. I believe, and this is where I'm at, if you wanna know where I'm at, uh, I believe that if the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead is living and residing in us, well, if he's God and he can raise a dead man back to life, he can give me a vision and he can heal a person and he can give a prophetic word and yeah, he can give people utterances of tongues and if it's on the menu, I'm gonna order it. Do you want anyone venture off on the menu? But here's what I think. We go sideways when we start to think, well, the goal then is to manipulate God. And the goal then is to conjure up some wild experience where we show up acting nuts and we miss the point. And then we get so obsessed with gifts, we overlook the giver of the gifts. And that is a huge miss. I don't think you need to twist God's arm. I think you need to faithfully follow Christ. And if God wants to do something in your life, he's God, he can do whatever he wants. Let's not manipulate God. And so he's creating this tension. Now, you have to understand this because he's going somewhere with it. And at the end of chapter 12, he says, but folks, I will show you the most excellent way. I mean, what a statement. He has just addressed all these things within the church. And he's like, but here, I want to show you the most Excellent way. In fact, this is what God has in mind. And a church that anchors itself in this mindset and this approach and these values, this is the type of church that accomplishes God's full plan and purpose for their body of believers. And this is the type of church that really hits the mark in what God has in mind. And he says, I will show you the most excellent way. Now watch where he goes. Just talking about the body, spiritual gifts. Now watch what he says. He says, if I speak in tongues of men, of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So imagine if you showed up to church, like, oh, I'm so excited to hear a word from God. And I got out here and I grabbed a stick and I went over to the drum kit and I just sat there for 40 minutes banging on the gong. You would think this is annoying. I have a headache. I don't want to do any of this, right? And Paul's like, yeah, that's the point. When you have this gifting without love, it's just a bunch of noise. And he goes on to then say this, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. He goes on to say this, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love again, I gain nothing. He says, love though is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And love keeps no record of wrongs. I love that. He says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres because love never fails. I mean, this is the crescendo of the idea. He says, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part, it disappears. What he's saying is, guys, there comes a point where we step into eternity and much of our spiritual faculties this side of the grave are no longer necessary. He's just saying, just understand, keep these things in balance. He says they disappear. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And many of you, you've grown in your faith and you look back on the things you used to think and say when you were early on as a believer. And you're like, yeah, I used to think and reason and talk like a child. And I grew out of that is what he's saying. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. This is the mark and goal of growing in your faith. For now we only see a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And then he ends with this. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The three greatest things in the world, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, here's what you have to understand what Paul's doing. We're gonna kind of build this out. He's doing three things in this essay. The first, he is establishing the value of love. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that. He is then laying out a pretty concise description of love, 15 very pointed and clear statements about love. And then he articulates and establishes the destination of love. So let's talk about the value of love. What you find in scripture is there are two lists. Anyone like a good list? Husbands, anyone returning home today to a list? Uh, you got a honeydew list? In, in scripture, there are two lists. And Paul senses attention and he's like, okay, we need to put some balance. In fact, what Paul is doing in many ways is he's creating a hierarchy to our ethics. So think about that, okay? And the two lists are this. The first is the gifts of the spirit. And this is what you read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the second list is the fruit of the spirit, which is in Galatians 5, which says love, you know, the, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all these things, right? And he's saying, okay, let's talk about these things. Now, when it comes to the fruit of the spirit, what is on the top of the list? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. You know what I'm saying? Now, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, what is on the bottom of the list? Tongues. So what Paul does here is in many ways, he builds an argument that climbs a theological ladder. And so he first starts out and he's like, okay, love is greater than tongues. And then what's the next rung? Love, love is greater than prophecy. Love is greater than knowledge. Love, and he goes on and on to where he gets to a point where he's like, love is even greater than faith. Love is even greater than hope. And when all is said and done, love remains. And this is so important for you and I to understand that a fruit is far more impressive than a gift. Now put your philosophical minds on for a second and think about it this way. How does a gift work? And how does a fruit work? Okay? One, a gift happens immediately. I walk up to you and I say, here you go. And immediately you receive the gift. And not only do you receive it immediately, you receive it passively. You don't do anything but receive it, right? It happens immediately and passively and it happens externally. Something outside of you is giving to you a gift. Does that make sense? Now, a fruit is on the other side of the spectrum because one, it doesn't happen immediately. It happens gradually. It doesn't take place externally. It takes place internally. And it is something that is cultivated over time. And what Paul is saying to this group in Corinth, and maybe what Paul is saying to many of us today, 
is be very careful. You do not get so obsessed with external giftings that you overlook the prominent focus of Christian virtue and righteousness and holiness and the fact that God wants to go to work on your character. That's more impressive. A person who lives with love and joy and peace and patience, well, that person is more impressive than a person who speaks in tongues is what he's saying. And this is is a head-scratching thing that Paul is getting at because Paul is taking all these supernatural things, these miraculous things, and he's saying all these supernatural miraculous things, they cannot even compare to love. And what they were doing in the church in Corinth, and if we're not careful, what we will do is we will get so obsessed with all these external things, we will overlook the paramount theme of it all, which is love. That the goal of your life as a follower of Christ is to live as a reflection of God's love for you, for the love of God. And Timothy Keller, again, I've already referenced him, but he's just a great mind. Once in speaking about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he made this statement. He said, love is more miraculous than miracles. He's saying, yeah, like, it's impressive if God gives you a gift and every single one of us have been graced by God with different talents and giftings and things that set you apart and make you effective in the home or effective in the workplace or effective in the community. He said, yeah, that's all impressive, but that's stuff God just gave to you, right? He said, but love and the love of Christ, well, it, when a person actually resembles that, I mean, that's impressive. Like, who has the capacity? Who has the ability to actually love like Jesus? And when people love like Jesus, it's like, whoa. That's the type of love that altered the world. And what is required for that to take place? God has to fully redeem, renew, and restore our fractured and deprived souls. And it is in doing so that love begins to emerge in and through our lives. And and Timothy Keller and what Paul is also saying is like, yeah, now that, a person who loves like Jesus, that is impressive. And it makes me think of this situation in Luke chapter five that actually puts this in great context. Jesus is at a house and he's teaching. And people show up, which Jesus was always drawing the crowd. And what's amazing is the house fills up with people. Some like Jesus, some didn't like Jesus. The room is full of Pharisees and self-righteous people looking to just find Jesus in air. And what happens is, is a group of individuals hear Jesus is in town and they're like, oh my goodness, our friend who's paralyzed needs to be healed. Let's take him to Jesus. And so they bring him to Jesus and they find they can't get in the house. So what do they do? I mean, the ingenuity and the intuition is outrageous. They decide, let's climb up on the roof and we'll just punch a hole in the roof. I mean, if you're the homeowner, like I wanna be open-handed to God. Like I wanna be like, oh, to God be the glory. But if I'm sitting in my living room and the speckle just starts to fall and someone punches a hole in my roof, I'm punching them in the face. Anyone else, you're like, what did you just do? And they lower this man down before Jesus. And Jesus says something just outrageous. He tells the man, your sins are forgiven. And and guys, the self-righteous people in the room, they lose their minds. The Pharisees are like, he's a blasphemous. He's a heretic. Who can say your sins are forgiven? And Jesus so brilliantly turns and responds to them. And watch how he responds. He says, Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, hey, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which again, if you're a note taker, which I do think note takers get to skip the line going into heaven, I would write down that question. Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Hey, hey! before you go into a conflict, before you send an email, before you make a social media post, uh, before you write a letter, before you pick up the phone and give someone a piece of your mind, you should just ask the question, why am I thinking these things in my heart? And so he asked this pointed question and it says, which is easier? Watch this question, this is brilliant. To say your sins are forgiven 
or to say, get up and walk. Think about that question. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? But he goes on to say, I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you to get up, take your mat and go home. Now watch how this ends. It says, immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. And this final statement is just so fascinating to me. It says, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God and they were filled with awe and said, watch the statement, we have seen remarkable things today. We have seen remarkable things today. Now hold that in your thought for a second. The question that Jesus starts out with, which is easier, to say pick up your mat and walk or to say your sins are forgiven? And here's the thing, the two cannot even compare. For, for Jesus to say pick up your mat and walk, all he has to do is give the word. But for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven, oh my goodness, this is a much bigger deal. This means he has to split the skies, come from heaven to earth, take on human form, live incarnate, and live a perfect and sinless life. Never rolled his eyes at Mary, never scoffed at Joseph, never impurely flirted with a girl in grade school, never had an angry thought. Like He was just so like pure and sinless. And then after establishing his ministry, after rolling out and introducing his ethic of love, after establishing the kingdom of God at work, he then picks up his own cross and he marches to Calvary's hill and he allows them to publicly execute him in public. Now, before we judge this group, just place yourself in the scene. Think about this. If you were at the foot of the cross and you got to stand by the soldier who went up to Jesus and was like, I just wanna make sure he's dead and takes a spear and stabs him in the side. And then you walked with the group of people as they took his dead body and they placed it in a tomb. And then you just decided to hang out with the soldier who was tasked with the job of watching over the tomb. And you got to see Jesus Christ resurrect from the grave three days later. And you got to attend the breakfast he had on the beach and you got to have all the meetings with over 500 witnesses that he had, what would you be thinking? You would be like, oh my goodness, like that just happened, right? You would be blown away. And, and here's the thing. If we were to roll uh, an individual who's been paralyzed their whole life out here onto the platform and we were to bring them out here into a wheelchair and we say, hey, let's all believe in faith and let's pray over this individual. And we were to pray over them and they were to stand to their feet and walk, what would we do? we would lose our minds. And for good reason, we ought to celebrate that. Like, look at that miracle. And what Jesus is saying is, it's not to say that you shouldn't celebrate that. It's to say you're not celebrating the more impressive miracle. It is far more impressive to say your sins are forgiven than it is to say get up and walk because you can be healed and not saved. But if you're saved, every single one of us will eventually and eternally be healed. It is so impressive. It's so great. And here's the head scratcher, and please lean in on me. And you're, I know you're gonna have to go home and you're gonna have to open up your own Bible, which is what you should do. Um, but here's what Paul is saying. He's saying there are people who have been graced by God with different giftings. Every single one of us have different giftings. And he's saying there are some people who are operating in giftings from God, but they're not saved. And maybe if you wanna do some additional homework, I would say go to the book of Numbers and look at Balaam. I would say go to the Gospels and look at Judas. And most scholars would say you could also put Saul into that category. You could go to 1 Samuel and look at the case of Saul. Individuals who were effective with different giftings um, but their soul was fractured and they weren't saved. And you're like, can that be true? Well, let's just see what Jesus said. This is not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father 
who is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What he's saying is like, there will be people who will camouflage themselves in gifting as saints. You know what's a, a, an interesting dichotomy in scripture? All the sinners in scripture thought they were saints. And all the saints in scripture thought they were sinners. I just think that's interesting. And he's saying there will be individuals who go through their life so proud of how gifted they are. And they'll get to the end of their road and they'll recognize, but behind it all was emptiness. Just utter emptiness. And I know what you're thinking. So that's crazy. God gifts people who are not Christians? Well, absolutely. Can you imagine how miserable the world would be if only Christians could do good things? No good architects, no good surgeons, no good teachers, no good parents. And God gifts us whether or not we receive him as Lord and Savior or not. Because what does the Bible say? Every good thing, every good thing comes from above. And what my prayer is as a group of believers is that we don't get so caught up, so focused, so impressed by each other's external giftings that we overlook the greatest miracle, which is the transformation of the heart and the redemption of the soul and holiness and righteousness and Christian virtue embedded and imputed into our lives. Individuals who live with that, individuals who fully surrender their life to Christ, that's what happens. They're not just individuals who have gifts. They're individuals who bear fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And Paul's like, yeah, that. And I just think, if you're not a Christian, chances are you're impressive and chances are you're doing well in a lot of areas in life. But there is coming a defining moment for every single one of us. And if you don't fully surrender your life to Christ, you are going to be so disappointed with the reality of your soul when you meet your maker. But when you do, you live transformed from the inside out and you live with an anticipation and a joy and just an optimism. I cannot wait to see my creator face to face. And eventually all this other stuff is gonna go away. But love, perfect love, is gonna remain and we'll call it home. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. I love it.